Chapter 5 Still, from this time forward, I began to prefer the Catholic doctrine. I felt that it was with moderation and honesty that it commanded things to be believed that were not demonstrated, whether they could be demonstrated, but not to everyone, or whether they could not be demonstrated at all. This was far better than the method of the Manichaeans, in which our credulity was mocked by an audacious promise of knowledge, and then many fabulous and absurd things were forced upon believers because they were incapable of demonstration. After that, O Lord, little by little, with a gentle and most merciful hand, draw in and calm in my heart, thou didst persuade me that, if I took into account the multitude of things I had never seen, nor been present when they were enacted, such as many of the events of secular history, and the numerous reports of places and cities which I had not seen, or such as my relations with many friends or physicians, or with these men and those, that unless we should believe, we should do nothing at all in this life. Finally, I was impressed with what an unalterable assurance I believed which two people were my parents, though this was impossible for me to know otherwise than by hearsay. By bringing all this into my consideration, thou didst persuade me that it was not the ones who believed thy books, which with so great authority thou hast established among nearly all nations, but those who did not believe them who were to be blamed. Moreover, those men were not to be listened to who would not say to me, How do you know that those scriptures were imparted to mankind by the Spirit of the one and most true God? For this was the point that was most of all to be believed, since no wranglings of blasphemous questions such as I had read in the books of the self-contradicting philosophers could once snatch me from the belief that thou dost exist. Although what thou art, I did not know and that to thee belongs the governance of human affairs. This much I believed, sometimes more strongly than other times, but I always believed both that thou art and that thou hast a care for us, although I was ignorant both as to what should be thought about thy substance and as to which way led or led back to thee. Thus, since we are too weak by unaided reason to find out truth, and since because of this we need the authority of the holy writings, I had now begun to believe that thou wouldst not, under any circumstances, have given such eminent authority to those scriptures throughout all lands, if it had not been that through them thy will may be believed in, and that thou mightest be sought." For, as to those passages in the scripture which had heretofore appeared incongruous and offensive to me, now that I had heard several of them expounded reasonably, I could see that they were to be resolved by the mysteries of spiritual interpretation. The authority of scripture seemed to me all the more revered and worthy of devout belief, because although it was visible for all to read, it reserved the full majesty of its secret wisdom within its spiritual profundity. While it stooped to all in the great plainness of its language and simplicity of style, it yet required the closest attention of the most serious-minded, so that it might receive all into its common bosom and direct some few through its narrow passages toward thee yet many more than would have been the case had there not been in it such a lofty authority, which nevertheless allured multitudes to its bosom by its holy humility. I continued to reflect upon these things, and thou wast with me. I sighed, and thou didst hear me. I vacillated, and thou guidest me. I roamed the broad way of the world, and thou didst not desert me. Chapter 6 I was still eagerly aspiring to honours, money, and matrimony, and thou didst mock me. In pursuit of these ambitions I endured the most bitter hardships, in which thou wast being the more gracious, the less thou wouldst allow anything that was not thee to grow sweet to me. 
Look into my heart, O Lord, whose prompting it is that I should recall all this and confess it to thee. Now, let my soul cleave to thee, now that thou hast freed her from that fast-sticking glue of death. How wretched she was, and thou didst irritate her sore wound so that she might forsake all else and turn to thee, who art above all and without whom all things would be nothing at all, so that she would be converted and healed. How wretched I was at that time, and how thou didst deal with me so as to make me aware of my wretchedness, I recall from the incident of the day on which I was preparing to recite a panegyric on the emperor. In it I was to deliver many a lie, and the lying was to be applauded by those who knew I was lying. My heart was agitated with this sense of guilt, and it seethed with the fever of my uneasiness. For while walking along one of the streets of Milan, I saw a poor beggar, with what I believe was a full belly, joking and hilarious. And I sighed, and spoke to the friends around me of the many sorrows that flowed from our madness, because in spite of all our exertions, such as those I was then laboring in, dragging the burden of my unhappiness under the spur of ambition, and, by dragging it, increasing it at the same time. Still, and all we aimed only to attain that very happiness which this beggar had reached before us, and there was a grim chance that we should never attain it. For what he had obtained through a few coins got by his begging, I was still scheming for by many a wretched and tortuous turning, namely, the joy of a passing felicity. He had not, indeed, gained true joy, but at the same time, with all my ambitions, I was seeking one still more untrue. Anyhow, he was now joyous, and I was anxious. He was free from care, and I was full of alarms. Now if any one should inquire of me whether I should prefer to be merry or anxious, I would reply, merry. Again, if I had been asked whether I should prefer to be as he was, or as I myself was, I would have chosen to be myself, though I was beset with cares and alarms. But would not this have been a false choice? Was the contrast valid? Actually, I ought not to prefer myself to him because I happened to be more learned than he was, for I got no great pleasure from my learning, but sought rather to please men by its exhibition, and this not to instruct, but only to please. Thus thou didst break my bones with a rod of thy correction. Let my soul take its leave of those who say, It makes a difference as to object from which a man derives his joy. The beggar rejoiced in drunkenness. You long to rejoice in glory. What glory, O Lord? The kind that is not in thee? For just as his was no true joy, so was mine no true glory. But it turned my head all the more. He would get over his drunkenness that same night, but I had slept with mine many a night and risen again with it and was to sleep again and rise again with it, I know not how many times. It does indeed make a difference as to the object from which a man's joy is gained. I know this is so, and I know that the joy of a faithful hope is incomparably beyond such vanity. Yet at the same time, this beggar was beyond me, for he truly was the happier man, not only because he was thoroughly steeped in his mirth while I was torn to pieces with my cares, but because he had gotten his wine by giving good wishes to the passers-by, while I was following after the ambition of my pride by lying. Much to this effect I said to my good companions when I saw how readily they reacted pretty much as I did. Thus I found that it went ill with me, and I fretted, and doubled that very ill, and if any prosperity smiled upon me, I loathed to seize it, for almost before I could grasp it, it would fly away. Chapter 7 Those of us who were living like friends together used to bemoan our lot in our common talk. 
but I discussed it with Alapius and Nebridius, more especially and in very familiar terms. Alapius had been born in the same town as I. His parents were of the highest rank there, but he was a bit younger than I. He had studied under me when I first taught in our town and then afterwards at Carthage. He esteemed me highly because I appeared to him good and learned, and I esteemed him for his inborn love of virtue, which was uncommonly marked in a man so young. But in the whirlpool of Carthaginian fashion, where frivolous spectacles are hotly followed, he had been inveigled into the madness of the gladiatorial games. While he was miserably tossed about in this fad, I was teaching rhetoric there in a public school. At that time he was not attending my classes because of some ill feeling that had arisen between me and his father. I then came to discover how fatally he doted upon the circus, and I was deeply grieved, for he seemed likely to cast away his very great promise if indeed he had not already done so. Yet I had no means of advising him, or any way of reclaiming him through restraint, either by the kindness of a friend or by the authority of a teacher. For I imagined that his feeling toward me were the same as his father's. But this turned out not to be the case. Indeed, disregarding his father's will in the matter, he began to be friendly and to visit my lecture room to listen for a while and then depart. But it slipped my memory to try to deal with his problem, to prevent him from ruining his excellent mind in his blind and headstrong passion for frivolous sport. But thou, O Lord, who holdest the helm of all that thou hast created, thou hast not forgotten him who was one day to be numbered among thy sons, a chief minister of thy sacrament. And in order that his amendment might plainly be attributed to thee, thou broughtest it about through me while I knew nothing of it. One day, when I was sitting in my accustomed place with my scholars before me, he came in, greeted me, sat himself down, and fixed his attention on the subject I was discussing. It so happened that I had a passage in hand, and, while I was interpreting it, a simile occurred to me, taken from the gladiatorial games. It struck me as relevant to make more pleasant and plain the point I wanted to convey, by adding a biting jibe at those whom that madness had enthralled. Thou knowest, O our God, that I had no thought at that time of curing Alapius of that plague. But he took it to himself, and thought that I would not have said it but for his sake. And what any other man would have taken as an occasion of offence against me, this worthy young man took as a reason for being offended at himself, and for loving me the more fervently. Thou hast said it long ago, and written in thy book, Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Now I had not rebuked him, but thou who canst make use of everything, both witting and unwitting, and in the order which thou thyself knowest to be best, and that order is right, thou madest my heart and tongue into burning coals with which thou mightest cauterize and cure the hopeful mind thus languishing. Let him be silent in thy praise, who does not meditate on thy mercy, which rises up in my inmost parts to confess to thee. For after that speech, Alapius rushed up out of that deep pit into which he had willfully plunged, and in which he had been blinded by its miserable pleasures. And he roused his mind with a resolve to moderation. When he had done this, all the filth of the gladiatorial pleasures dropped away from him, and he went to them no more. Then he also prevailed upon his reluctant father to let him be my pupil. And, at the son's urging, the father at last consented. Thus Alapius began again to hear my lectures, and became involved with me in the same superstition, loving in the Manichaeans that outward display of ascetic discipline which he believed was true and unfeigned. It was, however, a senseless and seducing continence which ensnared precious souls who were not able as yet to reach the height of true virtue, and who were easily beguiled with the veneer of what was only a shadowy and feigned virtue. <laughs>